There is yet more to talk about with Diablo Immortal. A few interesting things. Number one, some more of the true cost has actually emerged. It's kind of crazy. Also, we've got a comparison to other games in the gacha genre that essentially show how unfair and exceedingly expensive Immortal is. And then, perhaps most importantly, we have Immortal serving as an example of the play-to-earn economy. No doubt you've heard from Square Enix's president, from many leaders within the games industry, that play-to-earn is an emerging field that they're becoming fascinated in. Well, today we've got a perfect example with Diablo Immortal that shows you exactly the sort of thing they want to create. Make no mistake, it is not a good thing with the quality of the games and the experiences that we have. Now, yeah, it turns out Blizzard actually are so far ahead of the game, they already have, across their library of games, a play-to-earn-to-pay-to-win cycle. Quite incredible. incredible. Yeah. Quite incredible. I think it, it probably just snuck up in the developers before they really noticed what had happened. Absolutely. Quite crazy. Of course, I'd be failing my job if I didn't say, go wish this The Pale Beyond on Steam. It's the video game we're making. So if you'd like to support us, if you are down for a, a narrative RPG, sort of, you know, Arctic exploration kind of deal, then, uh, hey, check it out. Uh, things are going really, uh, really pretty awesome with it. And uh, your support has been incredible. Let me tell you, those wish lists, they're... Uh, Get in a more happy place, and that's good. Okay, with that said... <sighs> okay. Reddit user hits 7,000 resonance using 600 million World of Warcraft gold. Jeez. This is a fun one, but the implication of this 600 million gold is quite something else. Okay, so there's a Reddit user, uh, Nakebon, who basically is extremely rich in World of Warcraft. A total of 600 million gold. And they turn that into about 50,000 US dollars of Battle.net balance. That was then used to, of course, whale in Diablo Immortal, right? So they actually achieved this in a, in a pretty interesting way. They had a whole bunch of leftover BlizzCon TCG codes. So you could basically, the TCG is the World of Warcraft trading card game. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Spectral Tiger, of course, that comes from the TCG. There's things like the big Blizzard bear. I believe there's a Tyriel or something as well from the older BlizzCons that are just extremely rare, high-value items. So somehow this person ended up with those. They were then able to sell them for just eye-watering amounts of World of Warcraft gold on the auction house. Now, given that they turned it into 600 million gold uh, worth about 50 grand, I have to wonder why they didn't do this in eBay. But hmm. hey, it's what they chose to do. Now, it actually took them ages because there is a daily there's a limit basically in how many wow tokens you can buy if you're not aware wow token is the thing that lets you basically turn uh, your in-game gold into either one month of game time or 15 us dollars worth of battle.net balance which is you know the blizzard company store basically though notably cannot be used in physical merchandise yes okay so they got 3242 wow tokens at $15 a token, that is a rather insane 48, well, basically 48 and a half grand of Battle.net balance. And with that, they were able to run a grand total of 2,165 Elder Rifts. Of course, all of those big, tasty, you know, eternal legendary crests. They amassed 6,500 runes and they hit 7,000 resonance with four out of five res resonating bonuses unlocked. So, you know, they didn't finish their character, of course. <laughs> course but the character is now powerful enough to dunk on some of the uh, you know the cash streamers like uh, the guy it's all business who um i think is the one that asmongold reacted to i think they had a bit mm. of a chat and his post just ends with a warning cash whales i am coming for you yeah what's interesting is i was looking up because obviously you know this person has put all of this like fake world of warcraft gold into fake blizzard money which is sort of taking the place of real money that other people are investing and obviously you can't quite cash out with, uh, I believe Nekabon said they could have like sold this for RMT and made real money for it, but the TCG items weren't selling very well like for money. I guess Blizzard maybe have started to clamp down on that a little bit or something. But I looked at it and based on current market values on player auctions, that 600 million gold could have been sold probably for about 54,000 US dollars. Wow. But that's a, that's a thing, right? It does have that real value. It does have that real value because players are willing to pay for it with real money. But just put it into Diablo Immortal instead. 
Yeah, and of course, because that gold is coming from one account, it would probably be significantly easier for Blizzard to track down using yeah. whatever automated processes they have. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, like, oh, okay, but, you know, that's like... Blizzard haven't made money here. It's just transferring one thing into another. No. For every nope. single WoW token, Blizzard earns $5. Because if one player uh, wants to purchase a World of Warcraft token, right, um, to get, say, 200,000 gold or 300,000 gold, that costs that player $20. Hmm. The person who then purchases that token with gold, thus giving that gold to the original player, they get one month of game time or $15 of Battle.net balance. That basically means for every single WoW token, Blizzard earns $5. So if, was it roughly 3,500? There, so it's like basically 17 and a half grand yeah. is what Blizzard have made on just the token premium here. Yeah, that's what they've actually made in terms of raw profit. Yes. But there's also the thing of, this person didn't spend it on game time. Yeah. Which means the way it kind of ultimately is, is those $20 didn't come out. Obviously, this this player got all that value actually out of Diablo Immortal, but that wasn't money, monetary value. It was literally because of all of this, like little, all this trading of currency within the Blizzard ecosystem, all of that currency came from $20 times the amount of these tokens. Yeah. So this is, you know, $48,000 of Blizzard balance, which then went into Diablo Immortal. And then that was about sixty sixty four thousand dollars $64,000 total for the purchase price for all the tokens, which means... Blizzard made sixty about sixty four thousand dollars, and then give forty eight thousand of digital made up value, which means Blizzard walked away with sixty four thousand dollars. Yeah, and look, it's the sort of thing um, <laughs> we don't have a problem with companies making money Not at, all, at no. all. It's just it's the pay to win part that we yeah. don't like here. We just think that WoW Token is a app, and, and the Battle .net balance side are an absolutely fascinating business model. Um, it really is genius. I mean, let's just say a new Blizzard game comes out, and for the sake of easy maths, mm -hmm. let's say it costs sixty dollars. It'll probably be seventy, but whatever it costs sixty. So somebody gets, you know, buys that with sixty dollars of Battle.net balance. For that, Blizzard have actually got eighty dollars. Yeah, it's just a really, really smart system. Mm -hmm. Really smart. Yeah, and it is basically like obviously play to earn. It, I think it's, I think there was a Plex in Eve. And then mm -hmm. Guild Wars 2 and EverQuest 2 a little bit, though it didn't stick. And then Diablo 3 were elements of this play to earn kind of being before. But this is the first one that's really stuck and gotten big. And because it's Blizzard and not just World of Warcraft, it's this kind of thing that will stretch into every game. Yeah, that's the big thing. So Eve Plex, that's all Eve game time and yep. stuff. Whereas this actually goes into a broader economy. Now, that broader economy is just the digital products and services sold by Blizzard Entertainment. So it's not a massive economy. And for most people, it is kind of World Warcraft-related stuff because maybe they want to get a character transfer or something like that or a name change. But uh, this is like one of our best early examples of being able to cash out one in-game currency that you can earn to be able to cash that into another form of value. Now, what a lot of the big companies would like is for that to be something on a blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of battled on that balance, it is, you know, Blizzard coin, Blizzcoin. And then those Blizzcoins you can buy in the Blizzard store, or maybe you could sell those Blizzcoins for some uh, USDC, mm -hmm. as an example, or maybe convert it into actual US dollars. So that is what the big companies kind of all want. And then the worry, I mean, you will have seen the video we did about, it was like the Crypto Bro talking about, oh, it's 2030, I'm playing Crypto Crush Saga, <laughs> and I, you know, get a rare thing from that, and then I take it into an MMO, and then I do a thing, and then we go and we play Crypto Star Citizen, and, you know, it's like the same item, the same value carrying between all those different games. And the kind of end result of that is we end up in a, a more complex, but basically highly similar to an Axie Infinity situation, where it's far more just pay to play right and that is absolutely not the sort of thing that we want so with this with blizz it's just being done in their own little micro economy and uh it does just though show us the sorts of things that the uh, the big companies really want to be able yeah. to create so i think everyone's going to look especially with the launch of overwatch 2 and it being because this could happen with the original overwatch but it wasn't such a big topic but you know overwatch 2 comes out and it's free to play you can instead of spending money on overwatch 2 virtual currency you could farm gold in World of Warcraft. 
Now that's probably going to be less efficient than buying a token or something, or you know, just spending your actual money. But if you're someone who's like playing the auction house and can make millions of gold all the time, then you can actually just turn that into Overwatch 2 virtual currency and never spend a dollar, which is you're spending someone else's dollar yeah. if you're using Wo token. And then if there was the ability to have, you know, to cash out or if, if this was just running on like a coin, we would then have a situation where players in uh, countries where their like hourly compensation is higher, they will be paying. And then the supply of what they're, you know, the currency that they're buying, that's coming from like uh, the Philippines, like with Axie Infinity. Hmm. That's just kind of what's <laughs> going to happen to our games should this sort of thing come to pass, which uh, I don't necessarily think is uh, is the ideal ideal way for things to go. No, I'd really I think most people would rather play video games to play video games, not play video games to play video games and earn a little bit while they're there because that's soon pollutes yeah. the whole thing. Video games are supposed to be an equalizer, yep. and this sort of thing means that they are not that anymore. It means yep, that absolutely. it's not a level playing field. Now. Speaking of uh, a level playing field, <laughs> it does seem that most gacha games, they they have a bit of a limit. And maybe it's the sort of thing where they know that if they go too insane, they will lose their audience. Yeah, that's the whole thing, right? You need to have a game that actually feels like a game. It can't just be a super obvious, they, this is a money printer for the company. It has to feel real, it has to feel good, it has to, you know, not take the piss. Yeah. And Genshin Impact itself actually had a big drama because people did not feel that they were being generous enough yeah. in some of their events. So this is just how it works in the gacha side. So um, here, Twitter user KDog uh, basically went and used um, like a like a simulator, like a kind of a, a you know a gacha pull simulator for a number of popular gacha games. Now, what's very interesting here is that this simulation has no pity system has no pity system. Uh, but it actually gets worse for Diablo once we talk about the pity system. <laughs> so you can see here trials 1 through 10. This is just one trial is how long it took using the simulator, how many runs, how many pulls, before they would get basically the max quality thing. So that would be a five-star character in most of these games, six-star character in Arknights, or a five out of five-star legendary gem in Diablo Immortal. So in FGO... We have an average, $224. Genshin, $223. Arknights, $79. Fire Emblem Heroes, $35. So you can see that the average for a maxed out character in those games is significantly lower than Immortal, which is $5,600. Yep, and obviously <laughs> this is maybe not the most scientific, but in terms of probability that we're aware of, that have been like data mined and stuff, that's actually higher, a little, a little bit higher. The average for Diablo Immortal is mathematically closer to four and a half thousand. But then you look at the max and you go, what the hell is going on here? Yeah, so Why is this game so working on such a different level to the rest? So like uh, Fate, Fate Go and Genshin Impact, they actually have very similar numbers. They clearly have similar probability stuff going on. Yeah, and then you look at Immortal where it, it will allow for an 18 and a half thousand US dollar spend. And, oh, uh, and it will. And it, it, it will. <laughs> and it has. We see that with Quinn 69 who spent the equivalent of 16,000 US dollars. But Matt, what yep. about the pity system? Someone might say. Yeah, well that no. would yeah, that would work in most of these games yep. to get you this. And I've seen people say one of the reasons Fire Emblem Heroes maybe doesn't do super well in terms of the revenue is because it's really aggressive on pity. Where it's like, okay, well this is obviously it's a Nintendo property, so they have to be super careful and go, okay, we'll pity you all the time. And then Genshin has like the 50-50 pity system where you either get the character you don't you want or the other one. You 50-50 five stars and then the second time you get what you want. So it's like 180 rolls, which is still a lot of money, but it's still like here's a pity system. So your average is going to be below that in most cases yeah. because of pity across these games because they need you to feel rewarded, right? And then we get to the problem with Immortal. <laughs> yeah. Immortal does have a pity system, but its pity system guarantees a five-star gem. Now, you have to remember a five-star gem the five stars there only references how many stars the gem could have. Those gems can drop between two and five stars. So the actual best gem is a five out of five star gem. The pity system does not guarantee a five out of five star gem. And with a two out of five star gem or a three or a four being quite a bit more likely, the pity system is more likely to give you one of those. 
Uh, now, of course, then those gems, they can, you know, be boiled down into gem power. But as an example, even like to upgrade, like from a four star to a five star, you need like dupes of the four star. It is an insanely resource intensive, uh, you know, gem crafting system. So while this is not like the most scientific thing or anything like that, overall, it's pretty damn bad. This is, this just shows us. So even people saying like, oh, it's a gacha game. They are what they are. Well, actually compared to the other gacha games, Immortal is so much worse. Yeah. It's insane how, I mean, look at that. Minimum, minimum spend five times higher. Average and maximum 25 times higher. Yeah. And it's like, ah, I'd love to know why. Because the thing that looking at this, I look at Genshin, I look at Fit Grand Order, and obviously FGO was like basically the primo gacha game before Genshin came out. And you think, obviously, the people making Genshin must have looked at Fitco and went, okay, well, we know what you're doing. Those numbers are far too close for it to be an accident. Especially when you think of how MiHoYo would have went about making this, because they planned for the success. And then yeah. you look at Diablo Mortal and go, well, what were you trying to do? Whoever was designing this monetization and putting these probabilities together, what was your plan? Because your plan clearly wasn't to ip the success of Genshin and Fitco, which are very long, drawn out, Sure, there's a lot of whaling involved, but there's a cap on whaling or a reasonable enough cap on whaling. Not to say there is one. That's super, like, it's, it's still, like, multiple thousands of dollars. But it's, like, kind of trying to be fair. Trying to hold up some sort of, I guess, a facade. Like, yeah, hey, it's like hey, the, the we're, mixture we're game, yeah. of that and then how when, like, you know, anniversary events and stuff come around, they're really generous. Well, generous. Well, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, there, there's... It's like there's an ulterior motive to all of this system, all of this design, but at least a couple of them pretend to be fair. Yeah. And Diablo Immortal doesn't even have the, like the decency, the common decency to go, hey, we're going to be reasonable about this. They just aren't. And one thing that I love is uh, we actually have a new monetization <laughs> mechanic for Diablo Immortal. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is from the Gacha Gaming Reddit. It actually must be a pretty fun place to hang out, where a user called Shift Your Carcass has found a whole new mechanic, and uh, now the maths that people are throwing around is more coming to 540,000 US dollars instead of like 100,000 US dollars. <laughs> now, I'll still say, um, you know, some of the industry did say one point, like something mil to me yeah. at one point, so who knows? I think the, that million was like, you know, maxing out in a sort of, uh, you know, PvP context where apparently that funnel is really like designed for the Chinese market. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to yeah. say. Well, even if you look at the the average versus the maximum we had, because there's no pity, obviously it's not probab probabilistically likely, but if that's 540,000, right? On the, if, if that's the average worked out, then the maximum of that going by that is actually then closer to 1.8 mil. Yeah, so you know those, <laughs> there you go. So you know all those five-star gems we talked about? Yeah. You, you stupid bastard. Might have thought you only needed five. Well, guess what, bucko? You need 36. You need 36 five out of five star gems. Which all need upgraded to rank 10. Which all need upgraded to rank 10, which itself is a absurdly uh, resource intensive thing to do. So there's a, a sort of hidden whale mechanic that appears when you upgrade a five out of five star gem to level 10 that's attached to a piece of gear that is above rank six where the five out of five star gem undergoes a process called awakening, where the five out of five star gem finally wakes up because as we've talked about before, you only get sleepy gems in this game and you have to wake them up. And there is a currency, uh, like it, it does cost money to wake up your, your gem uh, and, as well. And awakening is, I think it's a one-time use item that costs about $15 worth. Bog. Just to upgrade your gear. Because that's literally, it's just, that's it, like, just $15 to upgrade it. What happens away? when one of these gems decides to wake up is it gets an additional five slots around it. And these allow for an additional five legendary gems to be slotted into it. Uh, and then each of those individual five-star gems also has got to be upgraded to rank 10. Meaning that you need 36 five out of five-star gems to be fully, uh, to be fully awakened. Now to, yeah, so to awaken the gem, you need the item that costs a um, thousand eternal orbs. And then if you are lucky and you average about 15, $15,000 per five out of five star gem. Is that really the numbers we're looking uh, at? Mm, no. Okay. So that was $15,000. That is closer to the maximum was discovered there. The yeah. average is actually a little bit lower than that, but 
Oh wait, no, no, maybe that's including the five out of five. No, sorry, that must be including it been ranked up to ten. So it is right because it's so genuinely confusing and so multi-layered that you kind of go, okay, so you're talking about the upgraded version of the five out of five, and then you need another six of those or another five of those to slot in. So you need okay. all that shit, and then <laughs> of course you know in the duplication, uh, you need you need dupe dupe gems for your uh, you know. Yeah. dupe gems for your upgrades so if you've got good luck this person saying 540 grand over a million for those who are unlucky i've heard the over a million number uh before so it you know i, I think that does uh stand to reason and this is one thing i remember there was someone um i don't know if they're from china or they live in china um because we've, we've actually had a few um yeah comments uh yeah from, from people in the region and they've basically said like oh like the, no the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to add a giga whale mechanic at the end that like you won't discover until you get to that stage mm. this is the sort of thing yeah resonance yeah, resonance. yeah. Um, and all of this yeah as you said you know increases your resonance and that just makes you extremely untouchable and killable powerful and it's the sort of thing where all the minnows fighting each other in pvp yeah sure whatever but their design is at the very top ranks of PvP. It's a extreme version of what uh, Troll Fjernstrom, or Fjernstrom was talking about, where you have the stockbroker and the oil baron, and they're fighting. And it just turns into a, a, a situation where it's like, okay, fucking Mr. Stockbroker, broke-ass motherfucker, only has 5,000 resonance. Weak. The oil shake has got 7,000 resonance. That he paid for. That he paid for. <laughs> So what are you going to do, Mr. Stockbroker? Are you going to let him beat you? Hell no. no. Put those gains <laughs> back in. Yeah. There you go. Crazy. That's it. That's it. And hey, they want play to earn across multiple titles. That's the whole fucking ecosystem that you know they're trying to build with the crypto gaming. So this is what they're trying to put into every yeah. game. Because as soon as you look at, you know, the... Uh, fucking crypto bro that we that we clowned on is yes. the big LinkedIn post. Like that's a world where all those cool items and cool things he's talking about, some motherfucker can just swipe and buy them all. Yeah, I mean that's how. You, I mean to go into like the PC market of what's acceptable now. That's what happens in Lost Ark, where you can just buy materials. Obviously, there's a little bit of limits, and because it's a PC game played by that audience, it's not quite as intense or as insane as a mobile game. But it, that is kind of the a little bit of the future of it where they are already training people to play to earn, but they're playing to earn digital currency, they're playing to earn fake things that have value within the game. Mm. The real key to unlocking this for people or for the for the businesses is to turn make that earning substantially more valuable to people and globally valuable, which we've seen in Nino Kuni Crossworlds. Hey. Because that game is play to earn, to pay to win, to play <laughs> to earn some more. And that's the cycle where imagine you're playing Diablo Immortal, but Whenever you win PvP, instead of this little, you know, happy fun noise of you're the best, you're the greatest, you're the best person ever, you're incredible, you have your ego struck, you also get more rewards back. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this loop of... Invest. Yeah, you invest, where that's what they're trying to do in, explicitly in Nino Kuni, where the higher, or the higher rank you are in PvP, and I think also the higher difficulty you're doing in the PvE farming the better you are at actually making the currency, which turns into Marblex, which turns into real money. And then what gets worrying is, you see that thing of invest? Yeah. And we're talking about this in the context of in-game items. You know, what happens when we have the fucking Nino Kuni cross-worlds uh, Filipino agency worker system? Because hmm. with the whole Axie Infinity situation, what you are having is, like, the people in the West weren't buying powerful Axies for them to use. No, no. They were buying them and then lending them to people in other countries. So right now we talk about people investing in a gacha game, as, as you were saying, in like yeah. Nino Kuni and, you know, get more powerful so you can get more whatever the uh, coin is called. Yeah. Um, but that, this can very easily turn into a questionable, a very questionable situation of, you know, of, of outsourcing this, uh, and, and it's a bit strange because I, I suppose like with the Axie Infinity situation for the people in the Philippines, that was like really great. There was this example of this town. Um, people are just, 
there's, there's not the economic prospects and they can go and with Axie Infinity, they can actually earn pretty good money for their region and that can be good for their quality of life. But I would just wonder what happens when this sort of happens on a mass distributed basis. So instead of gold farming being, say, like uh, the whole Chinese gold farming thing in World of Warcraft, yeah. instead of that being few agencies with basically just a warehouse full of lads, grinding away for 14 hours a day. Or a prison full of lads, but yeah. Or a prison full of lads. That literally happened. Crazy. Yeah. Um, I mean, what happens when... I mean, <laughs> what happens when the prison labor that happens, that weird shit that goes on in America, you know, the prison industrial complex, mm -hmm. but they're all just sitting there playing Nino Cooney. Bit of a strange image to think about. But, like, what happens when it's, you know, not just investing in in-game items and it's investing in, in people and outsourcing and, and then it's... I, it just feels really morally weird to me. I'm not cool with that whatsoever. Yeah, well, I think the term... It like, just it feels <laughs> like it can only end in a very exploitative way. Yeah, I mean, the term industrial complex makes exactly yeah. kind of... Was, it's less about here's a video game that you get to play and you, you pay some money to have fun in your video game. No, it's how do we turn gamers into serfs in this digital economy, in this mobile gaming or eventually PC gaming because that line's getting a little bit blurry. It's got blurry with Genshin Impact. It's getting blurry with Diablo Immortal. It's getting a little bit blurry with Lost Ark. That's not available on mobile. It's that kind of style of game of you're being trained to play to earn digital stuff. Not by intent. They're just making a nice monetizable system that works for them to make a good game. But it is training people into the play to earn mindset for digital value. Because your time is now worth digital value. Yeah. As opposed to physical value, which is kind of a whole murky area. But that's where everything is going very quickly yeah. into everyone is now farming their digital items for money or they're paying other people to farm their digital, item, digital items for money. It's all just going to turn into it, it, it's the gig economy all the way down yep. and it, so instead we're, we're going to leave this situation where we only think about like money and value within the context of professional lives and now what they're trying to do is they're trying to extend that way of thinking into our personal lives so that we can become I guess, more engaged consumers so that we can consume more, right? Like, all of this stuff is the antithesis to you going out in nature, you know, doing some exercise, learning to cook a new meal, anything that could potentially be good. And they're just trying to just build a Skinner box in your real life, but instead of it being a addictive game to play, it's a whole financial thing. That makes it so much more powerful. And I think we can summarize this whole thing with one very simple statement. And that is, fuck you. It's forever. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's that, it. That's exactly it. Fuck you. It's forever. It's forever. But now video games and earning money instead of having fun. But I mean, that's does that, doesn't that sound wonderful on paper? And isn't that the whole point? Wouldn't you love to play a video game and get paid for it? But you're not playing a video game. You're working. Yeah. That's it. And the sort of video game that you earn money for playing can never really be playing in the same way that you would play a game you'd actually like or love or remember. And that is what gets kind of spooky. Um, yeah. I mean, I imagine if there's people who they ended up in an RMT situation, are they going to... And sure, they're making, they're earning their keep for that, doing power leveling or something. Are they always going to enjoy the game itself? I mean, yeah. over time, if they do that for a year or two, and you know, don't just sort of like don't make what you love your your work. I mean, sometimes it is do that, um, but sometimes for people, you know, maybe they love art and then they make art the job. Now they like they hate art, they have block, they they struggle to do art. That's kind of a worrying thing. Yeah, and it's not even like this is all hypothetical because this is the fun thing, right? You were saying earlier about the gold farming in China. None of this is a new concept. This stuff happened kind of accidentally because of how the virtual economy developed and MMOs and people started to see them as valuable. And then, well, World of Warcraft was the big one, but RMT, the RMT market, the gold farming market, that idea of, oh, well, this is playing a game for, you know, for money. You're having fun and making money. What a wonderful world. But then you go and watch any of the gold farmer documentaries, and there are quite a few of them out there now, and you just see these Chinese people living in, like, dorms where it's just, like, 20 computers and then a bed and a couple beds in the next room. And they're like, yeah, this this was this was great at the start. And now I have all these posture and health issues because I'm playing the game 18 hours a day and I'm not really enjoying it anymore. It's now my job. So all that stuff isn't new. But I guess it's the same thing with all of the talk about NFTs. The people making these decisions and driving these and talking about them at conferences and throwing all the money in don't really think about the long-term effects on people. They're just like shiny new things. Yeah, the people who build this, they get VC money. 
Yeah. They're wealthy. They, that, they're they also, maybe you could say, more the Zuck type. Yes. They're maybe not going to be the best at empathizing with people who are not uh, in a similar financial situation to them or a similar cultural background to them. And I think this is just going to have really bad impacts when it's distributed across the world. It's going to be bad for gaming. It's going to be bad for people. So it's not something that we want to happen. That's really it for the video. Um, I do have a final little, uh, fun little anecdote for you, though. So we were looking at SteamDB and the most wishlisted games, and I thought, hang on a second. Oh, yeah. I'm going to try putting our game into that and see where it is. I went through the ranking. Uh, so we are, as of yesterday, it's like the 310th most wishlisted upcoming game on Steam. So uh, if you are interested in the game, you watch the trailer and you think maybe this is a game I'd be interested in, um, do wish this in Steam. Who knows where we'll end up in that ranking. So with that little tidbit and a bit of sly self-promo done, thank you for watching. Let us know what you think, especially if you've had yourself any experiences in this realm. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.